Here we are. As the leaves come back out, we move inside. This is a wisteria in my backyard, nice Japanese maple. It's real pretty out. And then, uh, so we got outlines today, and then we're gonna do chapter, uh, announcements, and then chapter 15, aromaticity. So my office is crowded with different stuff now, not you students. <laughs> but uh, it was my studio for a little bit, but now this is my new studio. The commute is amazing. You just walk downstairs, boom, you're in your office. So yeah, it's interesting. Interesting times. So oh, this is pretty cool. I think you guys will like this. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the drink Amethyst or the Green Fairy. <clears throat> it's a drink that was popular back in the day, still is today. And people like Van Gogh and other artists were drinking it. And it, they said, some claimed it had hallucinogenic effects. Now we're not, I don't know if it's, if it did or not. I've never actually had it. But now when you get it, it doesn't have hallucinogenic effects, but it has a lot of alcohol. But you can dilute it. That's what most people do. So anyways, the, the, the drink is very bitter. And uh, it, the, the bitterness comes from this molecule, or, or mainly this molecule. It's a very bitter molecule. And it appears the molecule was made through a Diels-Alder reaction between two of the same molecules. So two of these undergo a deals alder it seems in nature to make this in the plant uh, so here this is uh, some details for Rachel and other plant lovers so the uh, the drink is made from uh, anise fennel and wormwood a plant and then it's distilled like we've done distil distillation to make it more concentrated alcohol and then the oils uh, and the alcohol they recondense in the cooling area a condenser like we've done right and the distiller dilutes the resulting liquid. So when it's distilled, it might be more, have too much alcohol, more than you want, so you add some water just to dilute it down. And some believe it's maybe, oh wait, this molecule is the one that causes hallucinogenic effects, kind of up for debate though. So if you want, read into that. And then, so, but let's look at the Diels-Alder mechanism. Here's a proposed Diels-Alder mechanism. So. I have this, one of these molecules is going to act as the dienophile. I know this looks strange, the dienophile is on the left, we usually have it on the right. Usually I have this over there, but that's okay, we can work with this. So we have a diene, so this can happen a lot, this happens often actually. You have a diene, and then another molecule, the same molecule, only one of the alkenes reacts, so that's the dienophile. So can you see then that if I number these carbons, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'll put my roach hinge on one, swing it over to six, roach hinge on five, swing that pi bond over to four, and then another roach hinge there, yep, swing it up. And uh, there we have it, a deals alder. Now, this is kind of weird. This is not drawn the way we usually do it. You can see there is a one carbon bridge, but it's behind the new cyclohexene. So this is the one carbon bridge right here, which is this carbon right here. That carbon is this one carbon bridge, and there's a bond going behind the alkene that was just formed. So this is like we're looking at the under, underneath of a bicyclic compound. And so yeah, these two arrows, these two carbons with the arrows pointed in, they are bonded behind the alkene. It's not drawn the best. I was thinking I should take time to try to draw it out myself on Marvin Sketch, but uh, I do other stuff. <laughs> oh, too fast. Okay, so I've got Canvas up and running, and I hope you guys have used that in other classes. And it's not too difficult for you. I'm still figuring it out myself. But it seems to be a better way for you to turn in material to me than email. The email things were getting all grouped weird. It's hard to find stuff. I'm still not great at everything in my email, but I'll get to it. So please up upload all your assignments, like homeworks, lab reports, extra credit, whatever to Canvas now, not through the email. If you have trouble with it, you know, email me, ask me through a Zoom section, we'll, we'll get it all worked out. When you scan in documents, it would help me if you could make it a single file instead of individual files. Um, I know that the, the application Cam Scanner can do that for you, and there's a lot of other ones. Some of you are using Adobe. Uh, Ellis sent me an email about another one. Sorry, I'm not mentioning it right here, Ellis, but there's a lot of options out there. So. Try it out and uh, we'll get this figured out. And then I also added a discussion section to Canvas. 
Oh, by the way, your documents you turn in, they, they get turned into an area called assignments. So you click on assignment in Canvas and then you'll see like homework A, homework B, C, D, you'll add it into the correct area. And then the discussion section to Canvas, I have that separated into chapters. So if you had a question about something from chapter 14, you go into that discussion area, type in your question, and then I type out the answer. And everyone has the benefit of looking over that. And there's already some good questions and answers in there. So check those out. And I know I'm kind of all over the place. I have PowerPoint animations you need to download to animate. I have Google Slides that you don't have to download to animate. I have most of my material on the Google Sites. Now I have stuff on Canvas. So thanks for being patient with me because as we convert to online, we'll get it, we'll figure it out. Um, I'm using the Zoom software for my office hours during the, and during the lectures to answer questions. So I'm making, like this lecture right now, I'm making this video uh, Sunday night. So it'll be done by Monday, lecture time. So I'll be available on Zoom to answer questions if you're watching the lecture and you have a question, pause the video, ask me in Zoom. And I added a Zoom link to our Canvas page and I thought I set it up right. I don't know if it was just the first time I tried it, it didn't work, but today I did a test on it and it didn't seem to work. People, multiple people said they tried to click the link in Canvas to join my Zoom section and it didn't work. So then I emailed out the uh, like the web address way of inviting you to the Zoom and that did work for a few people. So uh, we'll figure it out. I'll, I'll do both tomorrow. You can try clicking in Canvas. If that doesn't work, check your email and I'll have sent you a link. Um, I believe if you wanna join a Zoom session on your phone, you need to download the app. and. It's free. You might have to download it on your computer too. I don't even know. I have it on my computer. Yeah, but uh, so here is when I'm planning to have my Zoom office hours. So Monday, Wednesday, 11 to 2. So basically the start of a lecture time and through till what would be the beginning of a Monday, Wednesday lab. I was thinking that would be a good, that's a good three hour session. And then, cause I need to free myself up to make, you know, the next lecture and get the data for lab and all that and grade. And then Tuesday, Thursday, I got those times, 9.30 to 10.30, 11.30 to 12.30. And I'll have other random like bonus times. You'll see uh, on our website, I have an office hour questions link or area, and then I have links to uh, some random bonus office hours I've done just to learn how to use the software and if I'm free. And if, if you need to, if you want, if you have a question, you could try you know contacting me through email or through maybe through Canvas too. I'm still figuring that out. Um, and uh, if I'm free, I can do a Zoom session and I'll let everybody know I'm doing a Zoom session. Um, Ahmad and Rakan made an extra credit uh, video. That, as I was saying before, you can make an extra credit video of a mechanism, a retro, whatever you want. And they made one and they put it on YouTube. So check that out. Let's look at a little bit right now. Let's see if I click the link here. Ooh, yeah, that's what I want what you think happens it's dramatic hey guys how's it going so today i'm going to show you how to make alkynes from alkanes oh, uh so that's going to be i'm going to lose my job doing retrosynthesis which is let's see always getting into it here he goes oh. all right looking good oh look cool. at that so now we need to go from here oh wait 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 this. You only showed the one in Antiomer, the wedge wedge. Show the dash dash too, right? And then I don't, yeah. pretty good though, Ahmad. I like it. Should have caught that Rakan. Maybe you did. Let's see. There we go. And it's gonna protonate, uh, deprotonate one carbon away from the uh -oh, leaving group. Uh -oh. Did this you have a negative the charge there? And it's minus charge. There it is. Yes. So, yeah. It's gonna go here. All right, good. We're gonna so check it out. Make your own, actually. Check that one out and then make your own. You'll see, I bet Ahmad can testify that when you take time to make up that video, you make mistakes, you start over, you try it again, you really learn it. Okay, uh, I keep saying, and I'll say it again, that I'll put lab data, but I haven't had time yet, but I will. For now, just finish off any experiments that you have data for and turn them in to Canvas, and also um, focus on your lecture material. Make sure you're real strong with like electrocyclic, Molecular orbital diagrams, Diels Alder, all that stuff we've been doing lately. Uh, let me keep presenting. And uh, you got a two point extra credit assignment. This article uh, down here, Aromatic Anions. If you read that over and then write out three interesting things you found about it and then three questions you have about it, and then upload that to Canvas, I'll put like a 
in the assignments area, I'll put an extra credit folder. And so, yeah, if you put, if you do that, you get some extra credit. And I'll, I'll explain more about that in the lecture next. So this lecture is presented to you two ways. I have the video that you're probably listening to right now, and I also have it as a Google slide on our website. So if you want to quickly look at the information in this handout, you don't have to go through the whole video. And now for our second virtual SOTW, we have a cougar this time. A biochem major gets paid to give angry people coffee at Starbucks. I guess through the drive-thru only now. Favorite house to be quarantined in would be Mimosa House or Yard House. Just depends on the time of day. I love that. I want to do that too. Born in South Lake Tahoe and has a tattoo of T Lake Tahoe. Has two dogs named Copper and Bullet. Got a, a Western theme going here. Actually misses 13 hour days at school and the 7.30 a.m. lab. That's funny because I always hear past students saying, oh, I miss OCHEM. It was, it was stressful and hard at the time, but uh, now I miss it. So you guys kind of get a mid-semester feeling for that, I wonder. Okay, so here's Copper and Bullet. How cute, huh? Oh. Our virtual SOTW of the week is... You can actually see her right here. I couldn't get that off the slide. And it is Cassidy Hildebrand. That's right, Cassidy. Thank you for being the SOTW. And let's have a warm Sierra College welcome. Hello. I uh, thought I'd show you something cool with Marvin Sketch. They have these templates you can use. You insert template. And they have generic stuff here, some rings, three, two, six, benzene and naphthalene. Got more rings, look at that. Cycloheptane, seven, cyclooctane, cyclononane, nine membered ring. We got some 3D cyclopental rings. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll be seeing these in chapter 15. <clears throat> and then we got uh, six membered rings in 3D, it's kind of cool, huh? Amino acids, got all our common ones, alanine, arginine. What are some ones? Valine you might have heard of, proline. And then, uh, yeah, and you got your carboxylic acid end and your amine end. And these, you can polymerize them together and make a protein. And then we got our aromatics. Wow, my mouth's not working. Got six member drains. You got the, look at these big old, look at this. Uh, this can be a dienophile as well, huh? Got the the E still being and the Z still being, and some buckyballs here. We'll be doing a lot of this uh, crazy aromaticity in chapter 15, and then we got bicyclics. What we're doing right now? Look at that. We got a four-membered ring with a one-carbon bridge. Got this one-carbon bridge on the six-membered ring, different than we've been doing. This is the one we've been doing a lot of, huh? So let's uh, let's select that one. I click that and hit close and drop it in and look at that. Got a bicyclic. This might be, you know, oh, we've got some endo and exo positions. Maybe I'll move that one up a little bit. Pretty cool. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Let's say we made something. Indo something or other. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Grab this, move it down a little bit. What do you think? Pretty cool, huh? Here, I'll put it, uh, put a carbonyl Indo. Oops. Uh, failing right now. Here we go. I didn't like that. Oh yeah, that doesn't make sense. That's why I didn't like it. It's been a long week. Let's say we go with this. We'll go H here. I know these kind of get too close. Ah, these kind of get too close. It's kind of a pain. There we go. Put some hydrogens on here. Uh, where? Uh, 
Come on. There we go. We got a nice window deals all over by cyclic compound. Let's check it out if you'd like. I made this deals alder mechanism animation and it took me forever but it's worth it I think it's one of those things you start working on it just keeps going and going so I decided to put it in the mechanism quizzes area so it's not an actual quiz I could make it a quiz for next week maybe or something I don't know we'll see but uh, it's under mechanism quizzes it's not a quiz as of now so if I go into there 12b animations and quizzes where is it deals alder so if you look through this, if you click through this a few times, you'll have this step down, especially if you try to write them out as you go. So here's the Deals Alder reaction animation. So here we have Otto, Paul, Herman, Deals, and Kurt Alder got the Nobel Prize in 1950 for this reaction. So here we have it. We got our diene, I color coded it, and this methyl is pointing out, and so is that one. They're not pointing in. There's hydrogens pointing in. So it's an out-out one. It should lead to a cis product. These carbons, these methyls should be cis to each other. And here's our dienophile I chose. Um, this one is a cis dienophile. The aldehydes are on the same side. That should lead to a cis product. So here we go. We had some toluene, a nice high boiling point solvent. A lot of times you have to heat up these deals alder reactions. So 110 degrees Celsius is boiling point of uh, toluene. And that symbol means reflux. So we're going to reflux those two. And what do we get? Okay, first let's count. There's carbon one, two, three, four, five, six. That's our new six-membered ring. And then let's go ahead and throw on the, the roach hinge there. Draw our curve zeros. One, another roach hinge. There we go. Another hinge. There we go. And so there's our product. I jumped right to the I add the Regio cam and the stereo cam right away because I already know it's cis and cis, so cis and cis. Let me number my carbons, make sure I got it right. One, two, three, four, five, six. So you see the green pi bond is now between two and three. Boom, there it is. All right, and then I'm gonna. This obeys my rules of out out makes cis and cis dienophile makes cis product, but I could also get. I could have. Uh, you someone might try drawing that as if it's a different product. Is it a different product? No, it's the same thing when you flip it over. But this one is a different product and it follows our rules. So the two methyls are cis to each other and then the dienophiles, aldehydes, are cis as well. So that's another product. And should I draw that though? No, that's the same thing. Just to flip over it, those two. Yeah, so I don't need to have the duplicates. So I've got my cis, cis product, cis, cis, and then I went all out on this one, you ready? This one is a meso compound. See the plane of symmetry through there? This one is also a meso compound, plane of symmetry through the middle of that one. So they're diastereomers because they are, they have the same molecular formula, same connectivity of atoms. They're non superimposable. So if I slide this over, it won't match up perfectly. It's not the same molecule. And are they mirror images or not? They're not mirror images, so that makes them diastereomers. And I, I don't know why, I just wanted to go all out on this one. <laughs> this one's an achiral diene, right? It's achiral. It's the same as its mirror image. This one's an achiral dienophile. It's the same as its mirror image. The toluene solvent, achiral, same as its mirror image. This product is meso, so it's achiral. This product's also meso, it's achiral. They're both, if you draw their mirror images, they're exactly the same. And so you started with a chiral reactants. So what should we get? A chiral product mixture, and we did. Oh, okay. Next up, I got some more examples for you. So that first one, I, uh, I'll go back. That one, I wanted it to be like real detailed. Review the mechanism and everything. And now these next examples, I won't go into as much detail. Just to do some, some more quick examples. So is that group inside or outside? Inside. Is that one inside or outside? Outside. So that, now I'm going to use the dienophile as an alkyne. So there's no inside, outside, no cis trans. You wouldn't say inside, outside. You'd say cis trans, but then there isn't. And then I got bromobenzene. That's a good high boiling point solvent. Reflux it. And because these are inside, outside, I'll get them trans like that. 
And the alkyne, don't have to worry about its stereochem because one of the pi bonds is used up. You still have two. It's not, there's no stereochem in there. And then we will also draw this one because there's the methyl and the ethyl aren't the same. It's not symmetric through the middle of the molecule. So now that is a different molecule. And they're both trans. So that's correct. Uh, okay, now the next one, I've got this diene and this dienophile. And uh, we're going to heat them up with, what's that again? That's xylenes. That's the ortho meta para xylenes. Heat it up. And now, oh, let me go back. So this guy, it's not really drawn up the way you were used to seeing me draw the, the dienes, but I'm hoping you have the ability to rotate it around. So look at that, I animated it. All the way around. Okay, now he's facing the way you're used to seeing. And my dienophile, it's actually fine the way it is. So on this one, we've got a methyl out, a methyl in, methyl in, methyl out. So uh, we don't, we're not going to have to worry about the stereochem because it's not it's going to create stereocenter. Now the other one here, the dienophile, it's got trans. So the product should be, for those two methyls, it doesn't matter. They're not stereocenter. But these are, and we'll get the trans product, and then we'll get this other trans product. And are they the same or different? They're the same. If I slide this over, I mean, they're not the same. If I slide this over, they are not superimposable. And if I spin it around and try to make them superimposable, they will not be superimposable. Next up, I got this diene, this dienophile. Heat it up, reflux with bromobenzene. This group right here, the methyl, is inside. That one is inside, so it's an in-in, so that one is trans, so what do we get? We should get cis methyls, because it was in-in, and we did, and we should get trans on our esters, which we did, again, and then is this, I'm drawing this molecule again here, is it the same as that? Can you see that it is? If you take this guy and you flip it over, it will match up exactly with that. So you don't want to be drawing that one as well as if it's a different product. Then let's redraw this one and then ask ourselves, is it the same as if we, is this? Yeah. If you flip this over, they are the same. I'm hoping when you flip it over, it's easy for you to see that the wedges become dashed. But now these two are a little tricky on both of those, you know, so try to make sure you understand that. Maybe make a model or just hold some pens in your hands like I've showed you. Okay, and now I've got, oh, a bicyclic one coming in, huh? I'm gonna heat this up with toluene, reflux it. And now uh, that this guy isn't really faced the way we're used to seeing it, but that's okay, we can just rotate it. And then the diene wasn't the way I like it either, so I'll rotate that around, diene file. And then I'm gonna number on this one because this is the bicyclic AB there for the bridge carbons. And what do we get? We get that guy. And let's number it too. So carbon one, it reached out and made a bond to six. So that's, oh, here's the other part. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. And then that's our bridge AB. And uh, this one, uh, you can see that the anhydride is down and here it's up. So this one is the Indo product, and that's the exo product. Which one's the major product? The Indo. The exo is minor. Okay, and then we'll move on. Got another interesting one here. <clears throat> Heated reflux with bromobenzene. We've got in in. Think about it, in in there. And that's trans. So what do we get? We get this guy. I got a one carbon bridge with the two methyls. That's there. Got a couple methyls back here, they're just hanging out on the alkene. And then we got the in in, that's basically the same side. And then these are trans because they were trans there. That ketone is indo. This ketone is exo. And I'll get this product as well. You can see I have my ketone down, this one's up, ketone up, ketone down. So I've got this ketone's exo, this ketone's indo. And neither product is overall exo or endo because they're, they're each group is, this one's endo, that's exo. 
So instead of saying, oh, I get a major molecule of endo product, I get the major product of endo, you can't. You get an, actually a racemic mixture of these two enantiomers. And they are enantiomers because when you slide them over, they don't match up. They're not superimposable. And if you twist this around, there you can see a mirror plane there. I had an office hour question about this kind of question, this sort of thing, and I uh, wasn't answering it well in the office, but if you, office hour, but if you go back to the Google slide of it, I, I work, I show you pictures, I made models of it. <laughs> so if you want, check out the office hour Google slides. All right, thanks. So as some of you already know, Sky had a poopy butt today. It happens. So I cleaned her up and it's hilarious. When she gets cleaned up, she, uh, she afterwards, just her backside's wet and I dry it off with a towel and everything. She's all clean. She always goes and runs in the house and rubs her face on the carpet. I don't know why her face. So, uh, chapter 15, aromaticity. What is aromaticity? Well, aromaticity is uh, something that when we say it, we mean the molecule has this certain type of pi bonding in a ring that makes it very low energy. So in terms of energy, when you have pi bonding in a ring, you can have this very low energy aromatic state or higher energy than aromatic would be if the, the ring for whatever reason was neither Neither doesn't make sense yet, but you'll see what I mean. Because the, the highest energy is anti-aromatic. So pi bonding, conjugated pi bonds around a ring, they can result in aromaticity or an aromatic compound, or they can result in neither aromatic or anti-aromatic, or the highest energy would be if the ring was an anti-aromatic. Uh, we're gonna learn what can make a molecule aromatic, neither anti-aromatic, and uh, we'll see that molecules will want to be lower in energy. They want to be aromatic, but they can. And if they get, if they're like in a situation where they could be anti-aromatic, they're going to try to be neither in between. So benzene is an aromatic compound. Benzene's aromatic. We'll learn how to tell why it's aromatic shortly. But first off, uh, since benzene is the most common aromatic compound, we'll we'll talk about the nomenclature of these. So let's say I put like an ethyl here and a bromo there. How do I name this guy? Well, I want to number the carbons around the ring like we've always done. <clears throat> and I want to have low numbers. So let's say I want to start, say, with a bromine. Let's say I go one. But I want to go two here. No, that's going to be high numbers. I want to go two, three. That's one type of numbering I can use. Another one would be start with the ethyl. One, two, three. And what do you think we're gonna go with? The uh, bromine being one or the ethyl being one? Bromine starts with a B, ethyl starts with an E. Bromine. So this is a uh, one bromo, three ethyl benzene. Not too hard, right? We'll try another one. We'll go with that, that sounds good. Okay, so what do you think the best way to number this ring is? Should I start with the fluorine or one of those methyls? Well, if I start with the fluorine, one, two, three, four, I can get a, a substitution at one, three, and four. But it turns out that one's not right. 
the better numbering will be to go from the, well, the, by the, according to the rules, one, two, three, four. So the red numbers, I've got a one, two, dimethyl, and then also a four floral. Okay, for the blue numbers, I've got a three, four dimethyl, and a three, four dimethyl, and a one floral. So, uh, this is seven, eight, this is six, seven, that's better, the red numbers. So I know on this one, I said it was alphabetical, bromine over ethyl. That was because bromine, if I start with bromine, I have a 1,3 substitution. If I start with ethyl, it's 1,3. So I gave you like a tiebreaker one dick there and you use alphabetical order to break the tiebreaker. This one, it wasn't a tiebreaker, the numbers. So how are we gonna name it? We're gonna name it according to the red numbers. So what do we put first? Do we put the four floral or the one, two, dimethyl. Let's see, we got a methyl and a floral. That's what we compare alphabetically. I know, it's nomenclature, it's weird. So the names for this one is gonna go four fluoro, because F comes before M in the alphabet, dash one, two, dimethyl, benzene. Yeah. And uh, check me. Make this up in Isis. No, Isis draw. That's another one. Make this up in Marvin sketch and uh, have it go structure to name. See if I'm correct with this. Oh okay, yeah. And then there's uh, one other thing about aromatic rings. You've been, we've been already using them a lot. Um, is this nomenclature where you have you have one group like a methyl, and then you uh, add on another methyl, like right here. And if you do that, you can refer to the first group, the first methyl I drew up there, I'm gonna call this one my reference, and you call that the ipsocarbon. That's the one I'm gonna reference off of, so that's my ipsocarbon. Then, adjacent to the ipsocarbon, this is the ortho position, both of those. Then the next one down is meta, and the last one across is para. We've seen this a lot, this is xylenes. This particular molecule is orthoxylenes. Or, oh, orthoxylene, not xylenes. Okay, that's orthoxylene. You could also name it with the IUPAC rule, this is one comma two dimethyl benzene. Sorry about that. Small board. One two dimethyl benzene or orthoxylene. Uh, then let's see about the other ones. If we go there, what's that called? Metazylene. or 1,3 dimethyl benzene. Next up, when they're all the way across from each other. Ugh. That's, oh, wow. Parazylene. And you have been seeing this already as well. The uh, oftentimes you don't just buy the, the, each of them, you buy a mixture of them, and there's usually some ethyl benzene in there too. But let's say if I have the mixture, then we'll call that mixture all three mixed xylenes. 
we put the plural s on there to say, oh, it's all three of the, the orthometa and parazymines. And you can draw it up uh, as a structure like this, where you draw, you draw like a basically toluene there, and then you draw one more methyl coming out from the middle. And that's to represent that, oh, that other methyl's gonna be ortho or meta or para. Okay, so that's enough nomenclature. Okay, as promised, back to uh, telling you about what aromaticity means, to be aromatic. So this all started back in the day when chemists knew that benzene had a double bond, a single bond, a double bond, single bond, but they were confused because double bonds should be shorter and single bonds should be longer, but each of these bonds are the same length. And you know that's because it has resonance. So it's not a single bond, then a double bond, then a single bond. It's all of it together, a resonance hybrid is Each one is like 1.5 bond. Each carbon is 1.5 bond length. So it's a little bit sh shorter than double bond, but longer, or longer than a double bond, but shorter than a single bond. It's like a 1.5 length bond. So that confused chemists for a while. And the, the, one of the, the legends says that the, the scientist Huckel, uh, he came up with this idea. He said when he was smoking opium, he passed out and then he had a dream that a snake was eating its tail, and somehow that made him think of resonance and, and why the bond lengths were that way. So uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's an interesting story. So um, now let's talk about what it is that makes these lower in energy, and also the word aromaticity. Originally it was like, it meant like molecules that have an aroma to them, they're aromatic, because a lot of things that are aromatic have aromaticity. We're gonna talk about it in terms of chemistry sense, just aromaticity means low energy. To be aromatic, you have to meet some criteria. This is from uh, your lecture outcomes. This is outcome two. Okay, first, ask yourself, can the ring be flat? Or the ring, it needs to be flat. So in order to be aromatic, you have to be a ring with conjugated pi bonding. And the ring has to be flat. If it's not flat, it can't be aromatic. Then you have to have all sp2 atoms around the ring. And notice I said sp2 atoms, not necessarily carbon. Oh, and if you think of benzene, does this seem to fit so far? Is it a flat ring? Yes. Is it all sp2 atoms around the ring? sp2, yes. So, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a carbon. And then, there's something else about this. If, well, I'll, I'll actually I'll get to that later. And step three is, it has to have a certain number of pi bonding electrons. They can only be certain ones. This is something that the Huckel came up with. So it can be that if you have two, two pi bonding electrons, you can be aromatic. If you have six pi bonding electrons, you can be aromatic. 10, you can be aromatic, 14, so if you have those many electrons around you, there's a pattern here, then you can be aromatic. For instance, how many pi bonding electrons does benzene have? 2, 4, 6. 
So does that fall into this series? It does, yeah. And uh, this series, you don't necessarily have to remember it, but because there's a, you can figure out a formula for it. Um, but I don't want to, kind of don't want to show you the formula yet because people get confused with the formula. But I'm going to do it anyways. So to generate this formula, to generate this series. You use this formula, 4n plus 2, where n equals 0, 1, 2, dot, dot, dot. This is just to help you figure out how many pi electrons you need. People get, the students get confused a lot by thinking about the p orbitals. I don't know what it is. I forget why they get confused about this, but well, if you get confused, I'll get you out of it. But you can see how if I put n equals 0 here, it's going to be 2. If I put 1 there, 4 plus 2 is 6. So if I put 2 there, 8 plus 2 is 10. 3, 12 plus 2 is 14. So you could generate a series like that. And um, then there's, a, there's a something special about this number 2 here. If an atom can be sp2 and 1, it makes the molecule it makes the molecule aromatic that will make it very low in energy if that's the case it will be sp2 We're going to see if this is going to contradict the rules you learned in general chem. Because in general chem, you didn't learn about aromaticity. And you just said, oh, if an atom has three things attached to it, three, atom, three uh, other atoms or lone pairs, it would be sp2. But now we might see that's not always the case. So, or if it has four things attached to it, if an atom has four things attached to it, say three atoms and a lone pair, is it, what's its hybridization? General chem, you'd say, oh, it has four things, that's tetrahedral every time, always tetrahedral. We're going to find sometimes it'll not go uh, tetrahedral, I meant to say, sp3. Sometimes it won't go sp3, it'll go sp2 because of the, uh, it makes it aromatic. But if the atom in the ring can be, if it makes the molecule molecule, if it makes the molecule anti-aromatic, It will try to be sp3. Or it'll do, the molecule is gonna do, uh, try to have like tricks to get around being anti aromatic, because remember, in terms of energy, we have aromatic. Neither or neither, and then anti aromatic. So, a molecule doesn't want to be this high energy anti aromatic, so if it can figure out a way to avoid it and go neither, it'd rather be neither. And if the molecules choose between neither and aromatic, it's going to be aromatic. That's what we'll see. Now, right now it's confusing, but let's do some examples. You'll see what I'm getting at. All right, here's one. Let's go with a five-membered ring, two pi bonds, a lone pair, and a negative charge. This is called cyclopentadiene anion. Okay, so now does this molecule, what, can it qualify to be aromatic? If it can be aromatic, then oof, it wants to be low in energy. If it's not going to be aromatic, then it's going to be anti-aromatic. It's going to try to find a way to be neither. Let's check it first though. Step one, can it be a flat ring? So that anion has a single hydrogen on it. And your first guess on that is that, 
from a general chem perspective, you should be saying, oh, that uh, this carbon has three atoms plus one lone pair of electrons. So, see how that carbon there has one, two, three atoms of a lone pair? So it should be sp3. Four things, sp3 tetrahedral every time, right? No. Now we're advanced. We're learning about aromaticity, and we're gonna see uh, it's not about just having four things and being sp3, it's, it's about what could make this molecule lowest in energy. And if you remember back, why we said atoms were sp3 hybridized was because we said if they're sp3 and tetrahedral, that negative charge is just, all the negative charges are as far away as possible, making it lower in energy. So this was based on things being lower in energy. Aromaticity is sort of like an ultra low in energy thing that can happen that can override just your sp3 stuff. So let's say it is, uh, can this ring be flat? I'm gonna say yes if all carbons are sp2. So if we say, okay, let's just say for now, let's go through this drill. If, let's make this sp2, 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 sp2. If that's the case, then it will, uh, we can move on to the next step. If it winds up that this choice makes us aromatic, great, we'll stick with it. If this choice makes us anti-aromatic, we're gonna, we're gonna say, no, nah, let's not do that. So here we go, Number, step two is uh, sp2 all the way around the ring, right? Yeah, sp2, yes. Uh, we're gonna say, yeah, let's do that and see how it works out. Okay, now this is another one, uh, pi bonding electrons. So, how many pi bonding electrons does this have? We have two, two electrons in that pi bond, two, uh, two pi electrons there. How about over here? Two pi electrons. And now that lone pair, how do we count that lone pair? Where would it be? Well, if this molecule is sp2, that means it looks like this, it's got a, it's got a uh, trigonal planar arrangement of atoms, the carbon, the carbon, and the hydrogen, they all have to be in the plane of the board. And then what's the orientation of the p orbital? The p orbital with that lone pair is coming in and out of the board like that. And can you see how that p orbital is lined up well with this one that's coming in and out of the board, and that one, and that one, and that one, they're all lined up to pi bond. They're all parallel to each other coming out of the board. So what are we gonna put that as? We're gonna count that as two more pi electrons. And this uh, looks kinda cool. It reminds me of like a boxing ring maybe, the pi, the pi bonding above the ring and then below it as well. It's like underneath there. It's like, a, it's like two boxing rings in outer space. So you can have one boxing match going on up here and then underneath, because there's no gravity, is another one going there. All right, so how many pi electrons do we have here? Two, four, six. So would that make us aromatic? Yes, because we said to be aromatic, To be aromatic, you need to have two pi electrons, or six pi electrons, or 10 pi electrons, or 14 pi, you know, that, that series. Six is there. So this molecule is aromatic. Uh, it, it's actually a couple things. It's aromatic. And that makes it lower in energy than you might think for an anion. And it's also um, all sp2 around the ring, and it's all flat. So remember when we started the conversation, we we're like, well, it could be sp3 or sp2. Let's say, oh, let's go with sp2, see if it makes it aromatic. And being sp2 made it aromatic. So it's going to choose to be sp2 to be the much lower, lower aromatic compound. I have some examples here. Uh, I think the, the best way to learn this is just do a bunch of examples and you'll get the hang of it. So to be aromatic, you need to have a flat ring. It's not flat, can't be aromatic. 
it, it has to have sp2 atoms all around the ring and they don't necessarily have to be carbon they could be nitrogen oxygen we're gonna see and then you need to have a certain number of pi bonding electrons you need 2 6 10 14 18 22 so there's a series of particular numbers that'll work so let's go ahead and try this let's start with pyridine here so that pyridine Can it be a flat ring? Yeah, I think so. SP2 all the way around. The, the first two are kind of the same question. Uh, so yeah, I say it's a flat ring. Can it be SP2 hybridized all the way around? These are definitely SP2 hybridized. Is that nitrogen SP2? Yeah, if, if it puts the lone pair out here and then SP2 orbital. So yes. And then lastly, how many pi electrons do we have? So uh, we got to count these carefully. The pi bonding electrons need to be in p orbitals that are perpendicular to each other. So this particular carbon right here has a hydrogen in the board like that, right? And then it has a p orbital coming in and out of the board. Uh, you know, I want to make sure you guys remember that. So an sp2 carbon can be drawn like this. All trigonal planar sp2 orbitals, these are the hybrid orbitals, and then there's p orbitals coming in and out of the plane of the page. Another way to think of this is if I rotate it this way to where my sp2s are coming wedged out and dashed back, the p orbitals in the plane of the board like that. So you have to have that visualized in your head. When you're sp2, your p orbital is at 90 degrees to the trigonal planar. So that's why we have a p orbital there, we have a p orbital here. I draw them on an angle to represent coming in and out of the plane of the page. And now what about this carbon, this nitrogen has a p orbital too. What about that lone pair? Is that in the p orbital? No, that lone pair is in the plane of the board. The p orbitals are coming out of the plane of the board. So this one is not a pi electron. It's not pi bonding. So, uh, my question then is how many pi bonding electrons I have? I know I wrote all over it, but these are not pi bonding. So I got two, four, six pi electrons. Is, is pyridine aromatic? Yes. Okay. Okay, this next one's pyrol, and it reminds me of like prison cell. Yeah, I've got like the prison bars, the jail. So pyrol, like you get parole. So we got pyrol here. Okay, can it be flat? Yeah, I actually kind of gave it away. I drew that hydrogen in the plane of the page. It's flat, yes. Can it uh, be sp2 all the way around the ring? Well, this carbon you should see is sp2, 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 sp2. Now that nitrogen, it can be sp2 or sp3 um, because it has three atoms, a hydrogen, a carbon, a carbon, and a lone pair. It has four things attached to it. General chem, go ask your general chem friends. You got a brother, sister in high school chemistry. They'll say, oh, it's sp3. That's, a, that's just what it is. Because sp3, they think, makes it lower in energy. They just don't know about aromaticity yet. So can it be sp2? It can be sp2. Let's say it is to test it out. If this makes it aromatic, it's going to be sp2. So next up, how many pi bonding electrons? Okay, so where is that lone pair? Hmm. My nitrogen is sp2 hybridized. It has three sp2 orbitals like this. And the sp2 orbitals, it's got an H, a carbon, and a carbon. And then it's got a p orbital left over coming in and out of the plane of the page. Like that, right? So where does that lone pair need to go then? It's only got one place left to go. It's gonna to have to go in this p orbital. And so our molecule will look like this. And it's got the p orbitals on each carbon as well. They're all lined up well to pi bond around the ring. So how many pi bonding electrons? So I've got two in this pi bond, four, six. Does that make us aromatic? Yes. So pyrrole is aromatic. 
and it's a flat ring and it's uh, this carbon, the nitrogen is SP2 hybridized. Well, basically we can experimentally determine it is flat and that tells us, oh, it's SP2. That's what we call it. Um, okay, next up we got the, uh, the seven carbon ring here with a carbocation. Let's look at that. To draw the seven membered ring, kind of make your six membered ring a little heavier, like wider. And then come up, but don't go two up to the middle. And then one more. There we go. All right, we got a carbon cat on there. And this carbon should have a hydrogen, right? That's why we'd have just a plus one charge. Okay, so let's go through the questions. So first off, does it have... It can't be a flat ring. I would say yes. I can see sp2, sp2. That should be sp2, right? Carbocations are sp2. Carbocations have just three atoms. Okay, is it all sp2? Yes. Is it, uh, how many pi electrons does it have? Two, four, six. Carbocation doesn't have any electrons in its p orbital. But overall, we have two, four, six pi electrons. So what do you know? It's aromatic. It turns out that this is a much more stable carbocation than you would normally predict because of the fact that it's aromatic. So that this is much easier to form carbocation than other carbocations. Okay, I hope you're getting the hang of this. Not too bad, right? Uh, it's kind of cool, this stuff. I hope you like it. Uh, let's do this next one. This next one's actually really easy, but some people might get tricked on it in the future. I don't think you'll get tricked by it now. But after you've done a bunch, bunch, you kind of sometimes forget to just slow down and ask the right questions. So can this be a flat ring? I think so, sure. Is it got sp2 atoms all the way around the ring? No. It doesn't, because this carbon has two hydrogens. This one has two hydrogens. So each of those carbons has four atoms. It, it can only be sp3. So is this molecule aromatic? No, it's not aromatic. So I did say, remember, I said there's energy the lowest energy is the aromatic, then there's the neither. I think it sounds smarter if you use a British accent when you say neither. You can say neither, but I think neither sounds fat smarter. So neither, and then there's anti-aromatic. So we know it's not aromatic. Is it neither or anti-aromatic? Hmm, let's figure that out. So we have to know basically what makes something anti-aromatic. This is what it is. To be anti-aromatic, you have to be a flat ring. Easy, same as aromatic. To be anti-aromatic, you have to be sp2 all the way around the ring. All the atoms, just like aromatic. The difference with anti-aromatic is the number of pi electrons. For anti-aromatic, the pi electrons are um, four, 8, 12, dot, dot, dot. Let me say I do that right. So there's, this is again one of those series, mathematical series. So what is the series? It's, it's not 4n plus 2, it's just 4n. That's the series. And then in this one, n has to equal 1, 2, Three. So you can see this is for anti-aromatic. For anti-aromatic, that's the formula. For Let me review really quick. For aromatic, it's 4n plus 2, where n equals 0, 1, 2. So, see the difference in the formula? Anti-aromatic, you don't have the plus 2. 
You, you have to start with n equals 1 to generate your series. For aromatic, you have 4n plus 2, and n can equal 0, to n equals 0 to start the series. So these are formulas we'll use a lot, you, you get it. Um, so now let's go back to this guy. Uh, is it anti-aromatic? Is it a flat ring? Maybe, kind of. Is it sp12 around the ring? No. So is this anti-aromatic? No. Okay, so it's not aromatic, it's not anti-aromatic. What is it? It's neither. It's, it's the in-between energy. It's not, get, it's not getting that extra stabilization of being aromatic, and it's not getting that extra destabilization of being anti-aromatic. It's in between. Okay, our last example up here is this one. Let's see what we have here. Let's check and see whether this is aromatic, low in energy, neither in the middle, or anti-aromatic, real high in energy. So we'll start off with, is it a flat ring? Uh, yeah, I can see it being flat. Um, and then it could be flat. You can think of it as, can it be flat? And then step two is, is it sp2 hybridized all the way around? So this carbon is definitely sp2. Same with that carbon. That nitrogen, yeah, that's sp2 as well. This, this here is in an sp2 orbital, the lone pair. Because the nitrogen has two atoms and a lone pair, three things around it, they're going to be trigonal planar. Is, those, is that lone pair going to count towards pi bonding? Nope. Okay, so this is also, this carbon's sp2. Now the oxygen can be sp2 or sp3. I know this is new. Before today's lecture, you probably just would say two atoms, two lone pairs, four things. It's, it's tetrahedral, meaning it's sp3. Not anymore. If it's sp2 and it makes it aromatic, it's going to be sp2. So let's check that out. If it's sp2, the oxygen will have one, two, three things attached to a trigonal planar, leaving a p orbital perpendicular, like that. So let's fill in what we have here. This oxygen has a carbon here, a carbon here, and then it's got two lone pairs. I just got to put them in where they can go. There'll be one here and one there. So it would have a, a pair of electrons in the p orbital available for the pi bonding. So these nitrogen lone pairs, they're not in the pi bonding. So yeah, uh, I'm gonna go with, uh, okay, let's say the oxygen's sp2. Check and see if it makes it aromatic. Um, so here we go. Add all my hydrogens here. How many pi bonding, elect pi electrons does it have then? Uh, we're gonna count two, four. This doesn't count, not pi bonding. These count, these don't. These ones are pi, because they're the pure orbitals overlapping with all the other pure orbitals. Okay, so we have two, four, six pi electrons. Does that make it aromatic or anti-aromatic? Aromatic. And that means that um, this molecule is, is extra stable because of that, and the, the oxygen, if you, when you experimentally, well, it's hard to tell uh, the geometry, but the molecule is flat. Um, if you protonate this molecule, this hydrogen is in the same plane as the, the ring, so it's flat. Okay, so as I said, examples is the key, just keep practicing, so I'll go through some more with you. So to be aromatic, you need to be a flat ring, sp2 atoms around the ring, and you have to have this type of electron count. 2, 6, 10, 14, da, da, da. That makes you aromatic. If 1 and 2 apply, flat ring, sp2, then, and you have 4, 8, 12, 16 pi electrons, you can be anti-aromatic. And if it's possible. But it, you're going to see molecules will do everything they can to not be that high energy anti-aromatic. They'll try to like break the rules to get lower energy, to neither. 
So let's try these out. What about that first one there? Cyclopentadiene. So is this one aromatic? Pause the video, try it. Okay, welcome back. So we got flat. I'm just gonna put it up here. Flat SP2 pi electron count. So can this be flat? Maybe uh, kind of flat? Okay, I'll go flat. Can it be sp2 all the way around the ring? Oh, wait a minute. That carbon is sp3 for sure. It has two hydrogens and it can't, can't put in, uh, there's no pure orbital available for it to pi bond around the ring. So this one is, it failed at that, at step two. So it is neither. All right, the next one is the cation of this. So, can it be a flat ring? Sure. Um, can it be sp2 all the way around the ring? Yeah, it's sp2. Those are all sp2. And pi electron count. It's got two, four pi electrons. Okay, how did that one work out? Ooh, four pi electrons, let me see. That doesn't sound like SP, it doesn't sound like aromatic. So remember it was uh, for aromatic, it's, oh, it's right here. <laughs> it's a uh, two, six, 10. Oh, four, that could be anti-aromatic. And I wanted to say, can be anti-aromatic, uh, this, some molecule, it's very rare that a molecule gets forced into having to be anti-aromatic. This one is one of those that can cheat. So but I'm gonna say it can be anti-aromatic and experimentally what we find and it, what it'll do to avoid being too anti-aromatic, it's still very high in energy. It'll like stretch out its bonds. So this will become much longer so that it can't pi bond around the ring to be anti-aromatic. So it's still a very high energy carbocation, much higher energy than a normal secondary allylic carbocation because if it, if it resonates around the ring, it um, becomes anti-aromatic. So yeah, that, that usually tricks up some students in the past, but you're, we're gonna just keep working on it, you'll get it. So it, I'm gonna say it can be anti-aromatic. And when I ask questions on the exam, I'll be specific about what I'm asking you so you won't be like ambiguous about whether it can be anti-aromatic or not. So can this be a flat ring? Yes. Can it be sp2 all the way around the ring? Yeah, radical carbons, we say that they're, we say they're sp2, they're trigonal planar. Okay, so that, that radical electron then is in a p orbital. So that counts as one pi electron. Okay, and now to a total number of pi electrons, two, four, five pi electrons got an odd number, that's interesting. So does that make it aromatic? Two, six, no. Does it make it anti-aromatic? Four, no. So I guess we just call it neither. It's neither aromatic or anti-aromatic. So it's not gonna be extra stable because it's aromatic and it's not gonna be crazy high in energy because it's anti-aromatic. And then this one we already did, huh? The cyclopentadiene anion. I just throw this up there to show you all the possibilities of that. So that one is two, four, six. If I make this sp2, that makes it aromatic and it is aromatic. This is a much more stable carbanion than would normally be expected for carbanions because of the aromaticity. So then I'll, I'll skip that one. I'll go to this one, the seven membered rings. Hopefully you're not struggling too much with the seven numbered rings. This one's got the negative charge there. Okay, so pause, try this one out. And we're back. Okay, so for this one, um, can it be flat, flat ring? Sure, we'll say it can be flat. SP2 all the way around. If I make this one SP2, I have a hydrogen here, I have the lone pair. Let's say I'm gonna go with it. I'm gonna say, okay, that can be SP2. Then I have to get my pi electrons, and if I go whoop, whoop, like that, that's gonna be in the pure world, this pair of electrons, huh? 
because that carbon right there, if it's sp2, it has a hydrogen up here, a carbon over here, a carbon over there. The lone pair would have to go into the p orbital. It's the only spot for it. So with that in mind, how many pi electrons do I have? Two, four, six, eight. Okay, what does that make us? Oh, could be anti-aromatic. So if it's anti-aromatic, it's super high in energy. So how is it going to, can it weasel its way out of it? Can it stretch its bonds or do something like the last one did? It can and it does. It does, yeah. What it does is instead of being sp2 here, it decides, oh, you know what? I'm just going to be like the general chemists say I should be. I'll listen to the newbies. And I will just go to be... sp3. So experimentally it can be found that this is trigonal, uh, tetrahedral electron geometry. So this way, if it, when it does that, instead of being anti-aromatic, it's going to be neither. Pretty cool, huh? And I have um, an extra credit assignment I'm going to give you guys. It's a paper in which they make this anion and this anion and they do NMR of them to confirm that this one is a flat ring with a equal length bonds all the way around the ring. And this one is not a flat ring. Well, yeah, I guess it's flat ring, but this is sp3 because, oh, I'll give it away. You can read the article, I'll give you extra credit for it. I'll let you know more about it later. All right, next up we got an octane. It, cyclooctane, cyclooctane. Actine, I mean. So it looks like a stop sign. All right, so can this be flat? Sure. SP2 all the way around the ring? Yeah, looks like it. We just got to count up the pi bonding electrons. So how many pi bonding electrons? Two, four, six, eight pi electrons. Okay, what does that make us? Oh, that's anti aromatic Could be anti-aromatic. Uh-oh. So, is it anti-aromatic? Guess what? Experimental results show that this guy takes on a boat conformation. Like this. Isn't this cool? So, it, it avoids being anti-aromatic by curling up into a boat shape. It's not a flat ring. Pretty cool, huh? How if it were, if it had the right count of electrons, it would be flat and be very stable. But the wrong count, it makes it, it would be anti-aromatic if it's flat. So it chooses to not be flat, bends up, gets these atoms get a little closer than they would normally want to be. But it's to avoid being anti-aromatic. Uh, would I expect you to guess that that had a bow shape? No, no. But I just want you to guess that. Oh, it could be anti-aromatic. I've noticed uh, I just was editing some of the videos. And I say, okay, or all right, or so at the beginning of every segment. Hope it's not bugging you. Bugging you. All right, so, okay, let's do this one. Uh, here we go. So, it, can it? So, okay. Can it have, can it be a flat ring? Yes. Can it be sp2 all the way around? Should be sp2 all the way around. What's the pi electron count? So no pi electrons there, two pi electrons there, and what does that fall under? Ooh, aromatic, it's a new aromatic one. So this guy is aromatic. It turns out that, that uh, carbocation is much more stable than you might expect. It's easier to form this than other carbocations that are similar. Here's a good animation you can click through. It was made by a student a couple years ago, Nabaha, and uh, let's go through it. So she talks a little bit about aromaticity being special stabilization, 
some other notes here. And then she's, like I said, said that uh, there's three energies here. You got the aromatic, which are very low in energy and more stable. Then there's nida in between. Anti-aromatic is higher energy. If a molecule can be aromatic, it will. If it, if it looks like it can be anti-aromatic, it's going to try to avoid it, get to nida. Uh, most stable. Aromaticity flowchart. This is pretty nice. She's got examples and everything in this. This is something I think you should click through um, to practice. So is it a flat ring? If it's not a flat ring, it's neither. If it is a flat ring, then you ask yourself, can all the atoms in the ring be sp2? If no, then it's neither. If yes, then you have to count up the pi electrons. If it's an odd number of pi electrons, like the radical, it's neither. If it's even, then you have to ask yourself, okay, does it have four n plus two electrons, where n is zero, one, two, whatever? If yes, then it is aromatic, and it's low in energy. If it's not, then it, it, it's going to be four n pi electrons, and it, if, 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 if no, then you've got to ask yourself, oh, can I have an sp2 carbon? Because up above I said, oh, can it be sp2? But now can it be sp3? If it can be sp3, it's going to choose to be neither. If not, could, could it avoid in other ways? Yes, it's neither. If no, then it's finally anti-aromatic, real high in energy. So you can see anti-aromatic really tries to not happen. So here, and, and she even added examples to this. Check this out. We got benzene first. You already know that one's aromatic, but let's see how it goes down the flow chart. So is it a flat ring? Yes. Can all atoms in the ring be sp2? Yes, they are. Does it have an even number of pi electrons? It has six, that's an even number. Does it fall into the four n plus two number of pi electrons? Yes, if n equals one, you have four plus two is six. So it's aromatic. Now another one. Okay, this one's a, is it a flat ring? No. <laughs> That one's not a ring at all, so neither. What about this guy here? Can it be a flat ring? Sure. Can all the atoms in the ring be sp2? No, those are sp3. Neither. What about this guy? Can it be a flat ring? Yes. All atoms in the ring be sp2? That's in a p orbital, it is sp2. What's the total electron count? Five pi electrons. So is it odd? Yeah, it's going to be neither. Then uh, this one, can it be flat ring? Yes. Can it have all sp2 carbons? That's in the p orbital. So yes. Is it have an even number of pi electrons? Yes, that lone pair is in a p orbital. So it is even is it got the four n plus two count electrons yeah it has six so that's aromatic there we go oh i didn't do that one all right then this one uh here we go uh can it be a flat ring sure can all the atoms be sp2 they can all be sp2 and total count of pi electrons if they're sp2 it would be eight pi electrons hmm how does that fall uh, is that the 4n plus 2? No, that's the anti-aromatic. So it could be anti-aromatic. Could it avoid it in another way? Could one of the atoms be sp3? Yeah. One pair of pi electrons could choose to be sp3. And if it does, then it would just go down to neither. That's what it'll do. So that one won't be like that. Either this oxygen or this sulfur can be sp3 hybridized and not have a lone pair in pi bonding. And here's some practice ones. So you could try those out. It's got the answer key. And a little more details for the answer key. So yeah, check that slideshow out. Okay, here's where I have that, that uh, animation we just went through about aromaticity. It's under handouts. So if you come down here, you find it 12B. There it is, the Nambaha uh, Ramley animation. There's other good stuff in here. I mentioned extra credit for you and it was related to this publication I was going to have you read. So yeah, this is the what it is. If you come to handouts, 
scroll to the bottom in the extra credit folder here, there's this one about aromatic anions. Let's view it. So yeah, this is a publication uh, online. You can read through it and then it gets a little bit complicated. I don't co quite understand everything that they're saying here, but I think it's good for you guys to look at a little bit of literature. And this is kind of a little bit of a baby article. Not really, but you'll see. It's good, it's good practice to start reading literature. So uh, they're looking at these uh, anions they're producing. And then you got your, kind of like we did, huh? An experimental, how, they, how they're doing it. And they took some NMRs and discussed the aromaticity of these molecules. So read over this guy. And if you give me uh, three comments that you thought were interesting that you understood, and three comments that you didn't understand, not comments, questions. So give me three interesting facts about the paper and three things you didn't understand. And uh, you can turn that into me, and I'll tell you what, I'll give you two points extra credit for that.